This week has seen ousted President Omar al-Bashir taken from a holding facility to the Kobar Maximum Security Prison in Khartoum. It is reported that al-Bashir is currently in solitary confinement. Plus, a Kenyan family filed a lawsuit in Chicago against Boeing over the Ethiopian Airlines crash which occurred on the 10th of March in which 157 fatalities occurred. Here's a peek into the stories set for today. Operation Barhane, thwarting terrorists in the Sahel Desert. Rwanda 25 years on, Rwandan born during the genocide or soon after speak of how this traumatic experience has cast a shadow over their lives. Donkey Country, we are in Kenya's Lamu County where the beast of burden is a must have item in many a homestead. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter is Teresia Washira. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. Thousands of protesters marched in Khartoum on Saturday, demanding a civilian government after the defense minister and the intelligence chief stepped down. State media has indicated that the former head of the National Intelligence and Security Service, Salah Abdallah Mohamed Salih, known as Salah Gorj, had quitted. He was once the most influential person in the country after Bashir and protesters held him responsible for the killing of demonstrators demanding an end to military rule. Defense Minister Awad Ibn Off stepped down as head of the Transition Military Council late on Friday after only a day in the post. <laughs> Celebrations erupted on the streets of Khartoum overnight after Ibn Off resignation. The new head of Sudanese Military Council said on Saturday a civilian government would be formed after consultation with the opposition and promised the transition period would last for a maximum of two years. <laughs> Protesters, however, kept up the pressure for rapid change following the overthrow of long-ruling autocrat President Omar al-Bashir on Thursday. The World Health Organization has indicated that an outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo that has killed more than 700 people and is continued to spread does not constitute an international emergency. Declaring the epidemic a public health emergency of international concern would have signaled that greater resources and international coordination are needed. The WHO Independent Emergency Committee, which analyzed the latest data, said the disease was entrenched in several epicenters in the northeast and was being transmitted in healthcare settings. Experts say the disease had not spread across borders to Uganda, Rwanda, or South Sudan, but neighboring countries should show up their preparedness. The Ebola outbreak, by far the biggest Congo has seen and the world's second largest in history, was declared by national authorities in August. It is concentrated in Congo's North Kivu and Ituri provinces. It has already infected at least 1,206 people, of whom 764 have died, giving a death rate of 63 yes. percent. In an interview with the media, Mashar, who is slated to be first vice president in the unity government, said that a six-month extension of the deadline was needed in order to unify defense forces and deploy them, demilitarize the capital Juba and other population centers, agree on the devolution of power and the release of political prisoners. The former rebel leader also spoke about the ongoing situation in Sudan and said he is confident that the new military leadership in Khartoum will continue to guarantee the fragile South Sudan peace deal. Supporters of the Bring Back Our Girls movement marched through Lagos on Friday to mark the fifth year anniversary since the abduction of 276 schoolgirls at Chibok in northeastern Nigeria. The mass abduction the most infamous action of Boko Haram's jihadist insurgency sparked a global outcry and the Bring Back Our Girls social media campaign. So far, 107 girls have been found or rescued by the Nigerian military or fled in negotiations between the government and Boko Haram. People marching through the country's capital called on the government to locate the remaining missing girls and bring them back to their families. Boko Haram has killed more than 20,000 people and forced about 2 million to flee their homes since it began an insurgency in 2009 aimed at creating an Islamic state in the northeast of Nigeria. President Muhammadu Buhari made crushing Boko Haram a pillar of his 2015 election campaign and he has vowed to spare no effort in ensuring all abducted Nigerians are fred. Ethiopian Abrami Law, 
upstage two-time defending champion Paul Lonyangata to win the Paris Marathon on Sunday. Milok locked two hours, seven minutes and five seconds, with Kenya rival Lonyangata coming in third as 60,000 runners took to the streets of the French capital in cold, clear conditions. Goulette Burka, produced as part of extra gas in the final kilometer to ensure an Ethiopian winner in the women's race with a time of 2 hours, 22 minutes and 48 seconds. Franz Clemens Calvin was only cleared to race on Friday after the last minute lifting of a temporary ban for evading a doping test last month in Morocco smashed the French women's record. Calvin finished fourth in 2 hours, 23 minutes and 41 seconds, bettering by 41 seconds the previous national record set by Christel Duini in 2010. It also bettered by almost three minutes her own previous best of two hours, 26 minutes and 28 seconds, which she set when finishing second in the European Championships in Berlin last year. A new French military base is under construction in East Central Mali after extremists linked to Al-Qaeda took control of Mali's vast desert in the north in early 2012. However, they were driven out in a French-led military operation that began in January 2013. Since then, the jihadist threat has shifted from the north towards the more densely populated center of the country where it has fanned the flames of local ethnic conflicts which date years back. A military base under construction around 100 kilometers from Gao in eastern Mali, where thousands of soldiers will join Operation Barkhan before being deployed in the Malian Gorma, close to the border with Burkina Faso. A Malian company is drilling for water, a top priority for this military base, although today no one is taking a shower because the water tanks are empty. Well, here we are. This is an area with field showers, field toilets and a few sinks. The base will grow as it is developed, but it's still more than enough for good, hardy soldiers who like to be on the ground. Before becoming fully operational in Nagurma, a helipad has to be built. While waiting for work to be completed, Chinook helicopters land on the fringes of the camp. Everything is under tight surveillance. For the past 18 months, Operation Barkan has been active in an area close to the border between Mali and Niger, mostly against the Islamic State in the Greater Sahel Group. The Gorma region is considered a sanctuary for several armed groups. These border areas are obviously the places most sought after by terrorists to carry out their actions. There's no better way to move from one to the other and find refuge than in a border area. So in terms of being effective, the Gorma for us ticked all the right boxes. Located on the RN16 road which stretches from Bamako to Gao, Gossi is an economic hub that hosts a large weekly livestock market. Operation Barkan's teams have been patrolling the shopping street since mid-January. Our objective here is to enable the population to go about their daily lives while pursuing our fight against terrorism. Since Gossi is the region's economic hub, armed terrorist groups, like everyone else, need to supply themselves. And so they try to take advantage of everything Gossi has to offer to get those supplies. It is our priority here to prevent them. The military's presence has led to the reconstruction of the local water wells. But first, they had to deal with some unwelcome guests. The snakes had naturally taken up residence, so it took a lot of work for us to get rid of them. We had to continuously pump the water out before we could carry out the work. It's been a useful way in winning the confidence of the local population, a mission that will take time, as the balance of power in this part of Mali remains complex. For young Rwandans born during the 1994 genocide or soon after, this traumatic period has cast a shadow over their lives, despite the fact that they didn't directly experience it. Two-thirds of the population born in the wake of the slaughter face a burden of their own, having grown up in the shadow of unspeakable atrocities and carrying the weight of expectations of a brighter future. 
Every April, when Rwanda remembers the hundreds of thousands massacred in the 1994 genocide, survivors relieve trauma that has fueled many nightmares. But the two-thirds of the population born in the wake of the slaughter face a burden of their own, having grown up in the shadow of unspeakable atrocities and carrying the weight of expectations of a brighter future. For us as people who grew up after the events, one would tend to think that it doesn't affect us directly, but I would say it does because you know, especially when you get to an age where you start questioning things, you're not seeing parents or you're not seeing grandparents or relatives. When you get to learn how they died and why they died, it's kind of a toll on us too. Moringira works for an advertising agency in Rwanda's capital Kigali. He was born a year after the slaughter. You know, it's, it's, it's a painful memory that a lot of families in Rwanda decide, you know, have found that the best way to cope is to just and try to put it in their past. But it's not an easy thing to do. Young people feel the absence of those they never even knew. Grandparents, even their own parents. The gaps in family are constant reminders of those who are lost. Jean Paul Haguma, now 26 years, was a one-year-old baby when the killing began. He doesn't want to talk about the details of what happened to his family. We live with the consequences of the genocide, where you find that some people are separated from their families or maybe don't have them. The perpetrators, the victims, and those who were not alive then all face the same consequences. Uh, yeah, so thank you once again. Supporters of the government praise the advances Rwanda has made in terms of peace and reconciliation and speak of its economic success. Young people echo the rhetoric of Rwanda's tough government in supporting development for the tiny landlocked nation. Commemorating makes us strong. It helps us achieve what we had not achieved and makes us think that we should stand up for the Rwandan people who have left us to have a better country that is not characterized by ethnicity as it was in the past. Those who grew up after the genocide were taught the core concept of Rwandan unity and how splits between different groups paved the way for the massacre of at least 800,000 people. Emmanuel Habumugiza was born in May 1994 in the middle of the genocide. His father was murdered. From the pain and loss, he hopes there is a lesson for the future. There is a benefit in reading the history of Rwanda's genocide and of the other countries that have seen such a suffering. Every person deal with the legacy of genocide in their own way. Some try to remember while others do everything to forget. In the past few weeks, Burundi has been in the news after the country banned the BBC and the VOA. Critics say that the authorities are trying to silence and muzzle the media. But why has this small Central African country been in the news lately? Let's find out. Just 28,000 square kilometers of Burundi is one of the smallest countries in Africa. But the crisis unleashed by the controversial re-election of President Pierre Nkurunziza in 2015 threatens the stability of the entire Great Lakes region. Burundi's neighbors are Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania and Uganda in the north, five countries with interconnected problems. Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo is at the heart of the region's instability, specifically north and south Kivu. At the end of the genocide of Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994, there was an influx of refugees, mainly Rwandan Hutus fearing reprisals into Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, then known as Zaire. The refugees found themselves in the middle of two Congo wars involving armies from Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda and Burundi, and from other afield, Angola, Zimbabwe and Chad. Complex regional alliances, a wealth of resources, and the entrenchment of rebel groups from Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi in the Congolese mountains have made the presence of troops patrolling in the Kivu region a common sight. Countries such as Rwanda and Uganda have also been accused of fueling regional instability through their covert support of violent militias. Burundi is no stranger to conflict either. 
including the inter-ethnic massacres of 1972 and bloody civil war from 1993 to 2006, which led to hundreds of thousands of people to flee mainly to Tanzania. A decade later, violent clashes have sent another exodus of refugees to neighboring countries, particularly Rwanda and Tanzania. Pablo Picasso in Ivory Coast, an Ivorian village tells of its brush with the great Spanish artist. Don't touch that dial, keep it switched. We'll be right back. Welcome back. In case you just joined us, you're watching Africa Focus. Today's sign language interpreter is Teresia Washiro. Now, Lamu Town is Kenya's oldest continually inhabited center and was one of the original Swahili settlements along the East African coast. It's believed to have been established around 1370. The town is synonymous with a donkey. The beast of burden is used by most people of the island and almost runs the economy of the island. 30 years ago, Dr. Elizabeth Svensson established a donkey sanctuary in the area that takes care of the beloved animal. The history of Lamu dates back to more than a century ago, and the story of this beautiful coastal town cannot be told without mentioning donkeys. The island is home to more than 2,000 donkeys. The town itself was built by the beast of burden that carried every luggage. In the sanctuary, we meet Hussein Meji. He has brought his three-year-old mule for medical assessment. His stool has warm, he has a dry cough, and lost his appetite. Dr. Felix Rachuojo is examining him at least to give him a proper diagnosis. Sasa hapa, sisi ndipo mahali peke yake tunakopa amini. Ukipigia Dr. Felix Simu, hata kama huleti punda, anaweza kukutumania mtu kakopea dawa. And it's for free. So I mean, lipom notice ya kuhivo, nikasema ni mlete, pia kuna hiki kidonda, apati at least ya kuwe, ya kuwe treated. In his table, Hussein has six other barrows that he has domesticated. The barrows, however, are not used for his day-to-day -day activities. 75% of families in the area own at least two to three donkeys. Punda wamekuwa wakiwa msaada mkubwa, wakifanya kazi kubwa lamu. Majengo yote unaweaona. In this island, the Rocky Mountain canaries are more popular than cars and even the invasion of motorbikes has not outdone their numbers. They can be seen everywhere, from the narrow alleys, the sandy beaches and also taking bath in the ocean. The community's culture is so engrossed in them that children as young as seven years can easily ride donkeys. The Donkey Sanctuary was established on 4th of July 1987 to cater for the needs of these beasts of burden, a day that has now been turned into Independence Day for donkeys in Lamu. The poor condition of the animals was the main reason Dr. Elizabeth Svensson started the Donkey Sanctuary. As an organization, our responsibility is to offer free veterinary services to the donkeys, to the, donkey, the donkeys, so it means that we don't charge the donkey users. Their responsibility is just to bring their donkeys to the hospital and we'll offer all the veterinary treatment that they need. Trimming of hooves, deworming programs and community outreaches has also enhanced the wellness of the animal, which increased their lifespan. A marked improvement in the donkey care has been observed since the annual competition for the best condition donkey was started. But then again, their population is decreasing. So some donkey users are, 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 are uh, getting into the motorbike uh, business. They are leaving the, the work that they initially used to do with the donkeys and venturing into the motorbike business. So you find that that one has led to a decrease in the population of donkeys. Unfortunately, this tranquil island has recently been invaded by hyenas that have posed a threat to the donkeys, leading to a human wildlife conflict. Zaidi ya punta mia tatu saizi wameliwa na hyena. Na KWS hata hawa tusaidi, hawa tusaidi, wataenda tusiku moja waangalie, warudi. With a population of about 3,000 donkeys in Lamu Island alone, the donkey sanctuary has become a safe haven for donkeys within this region. 
In the small village of Fakaha in Northern Ivory Coast, local artisans swear that Spanish artist Pablo Picasso visited the villages and was inspired by the local paintings that continue to be produced to this day. Let's take a look. Soro Navagi is keen to extinguish any doubts about Picasso's visit to a small Ivorian village famed for its painted textiles. Whether in tourist brochures or online, it is not unusual to find references to Picasso's reputed visit to Fakaha, a remote village in northern Ivory Coast, some 650 kilometers from Abidjan, the economic capital. French travel guide Petit Foutet describes Fakaha as internationally renowned for its handspun cotton cloth, which is painted by the Sanufo people and that once charmed a certain Picasso as it paid a discreet visit to the region at the turn of the century. When he came, he did a week here the first time. It was 1968. A whole mythology has grown up around the question of Africa and Picasso, who never spoke of having been to Fakaha. For the artist who once provocatively brushed off the subject, saying Negro art, don't know it, was also an ardent admirer and passionate collector of African art, who built an impressive private collection highlighting the resemblance between African sculpture and some of Picasso's work. Many art critics see the symbolism and imagery of Africa as one of his sources of inspiration. One often cited example is a striking similarity between an African grebo mask and one of the faces in his 1907 work. Several hundred residents of Fakaha, there is no question about where the celebrated Andalusian artist and sculptor found his inspiration after stumbling upon their village some 15 kilometers from the main road to Korogo. For decades, these local artists have been hard at work in open huts around a sandy truck where they can be found smearing earth-based pigments onto canvas. And there is an element of Picasso in it, with a definite similarity between his works and those of the artists of Fakaha. In Fakaha, here we work. Our work is a father-son job. From the age of 15, children learn to draw one small canvases before moving on to large canvases once you are qualified. But is this just a random resemblance or creative coincidence? Or did Pablo Picasso actually see or even own one of the Fakaha canvases? Ducking into his house, Soro Navagi comes up with the ultimate proof, a cotton canvas featuring Picasso himself. The fabric is covered with multiple motifs of a bald, white man, sometimes wearing shorts and sometimes in a grass cart, who is furiously clutching a pencil or paintbrush or even some twigs, a self-portrait by the master. Surely there can be no doubt, even for an amateur, that this is Picasso, proclaims Navagi. He did this. He created this during his three trips to Fakaha. We did not start this painting. That's him. He started it when I was still a child, and I not yet finished it when I became a man. He did it gradually. We make our canvases slowly, without haste. You make the colors brown, then black. Attached to the canvas is a self-declared certificate of authenticity signed by a travel agent who attests to having witnessed the visit. Picasso died in 1973 at the age of 91. And other villagers concede that his visit was probably earlier than 1968, given his age by then. If he did make the journey, Picasso would have had to take a boat to Abidjan, then travel the remaining 1,000 kilometers by road in scorching dry conditions with little shade from the sun, an adventure more suited to an explorer. Even so, the story retains an element of mysterious intrigue. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you. So make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268 and on Azam TV channel 138. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this journey. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.